Hi everyone and welcome back to the shack for a good old fashioned refurb of this Spectrum 128K Plus 2A which I grabbed off eBay advertised as faulty for spares or repair. So let's see what's going on. Here at the Shack, we'd like to give a huge thank you to the sponsor for this video, PCB Way. They help us out with all of our PCB fabrication needs and make fantastic boards at amazingly competitive prices. And it's not only PCBs that are on the menu. Apart from other fabrication services like CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and injection moulding, PCB Way also have a great projects library of cool stuff to build from people all around the world. Oh, and if you don't like waving a soldering iron about, they can even assemble your PCBs for you. That's the PCB way. Right, on with the show. The Spectrum Plus 2A replaced the Plus 2, which had been Amstrad's first Sinclair branded machine after their purchase of the Spectrum range and Sinclair brand in 1986. Even though the Plus 3 had already been released with its fancy disk drive, the Plus 2 range was still incredibly popular owing to its built-in data corner to take advantage of the enormous back catalogue of titles on tape. The Plus 2 onwards had proper keyboards, and jolly nice they were too, although overall the machines lacked the design flair of Mr Rick Dickinson and were just a bit Amstrad-y for my liking, looking very much a miniature version of the CPC-464, albeit without the funky coloured keys. On the back of the machine there's a tape and sound port, we'll be coming back to that later. We have the RF output for the old TV, but we also have an RGB output for nice clear video. We have an AUX socket and an RS-232 stroke MIDI port. There's a standard Spectrum expansion port, followed by the power supply input, this model requiring both 12 volt and 5 volt, so a proprietary power supply is needed. And then finally, the printer port. On the left hand side of the machine, we have a pair of joystick ports and a very welcome reset switch. The machine didn't come with a power supply, and so I grabbed this one, which was cheaper and should also be more reliable than the original unit. This power supply is missing the negative 12 volt feed, but that's only required for the RS-232 port, so we're not gonna miss that. I also grabbed this SCART cable so we can get the benefit of that glorious RGB output. Right, let's see what happens when we power up. I'm not expecting anything as it was advertised as faulty, but you never know. And yes, we've got some examining to do. One good sign is that we're definitely getting power into the machine because the power light's illuminated, so at least something is working. So let's get inside and take a look. And I'm using my lovely Kai Wheat's electric screwdriver set again. I do love this set, but I do have a gripe if you're listening, Kai Wheat's. Some of these screws are deep inside a tube and there's no extension bits included. So for these screws at least, it's back to basics. I'll leave that one with you to sort out, Kaiwitz. As always, with anything we're taking apart, we need to make sure we're being careful not to pull on wires or stress old plastics. In this Spectrum Plus 2A, we need to detach the cable that connects the tape drive to the mainboard and then we need to remove the two ribbon cables that connect the keyboard. We can then put the top of the case away for now. Presuming we manage to get this thing working, we'll definitely be needing to give it a clean as it's very dirty in here. Let's take the main board out so we can get a good look at it. And we should note that this is an Amstrad 10833 board, which is actually a Spectrum Plus 2B mainboard. But this isn't uncommon, a large number of Plus 2As were shipped with the Plus 2B mainboard. Let's get the old multimeter out and make sure that we're getting the right voltages to the board from the PSU. And there's a nice steady 12.7 volts there. 
and a steady 5.18 volts there. Nice. Let's just make sure that the voltage is making it through the board. And yes, we've got a nice 5 volt to the ROM chips, so I'm pretty certain that power delivery and distribution is good. But I'll just go and have a little cup of tea and a slice of cake and then check all of the other ICs. Well, all of the other chips were receiving the right voltages, but when I started to check for shorts, I noted that I was getting a short on the data lines on the Z80. Pulling it, cleaning it, rehousing, and even replacing it still resulted in a short. Looking at a schematic of the main board, the data lines go to the 40077 gate array, which made my heart sink a little because A, they're expensive to replace, and B, they're tricky to replace. But let's take a look anyway to see if there's anything amiss. Everything is a little bit dusty, but I can't see anything out of place until, wait, what's this in the corner? It looks like something sitting across the pins. Let's zoom in and take a closer look. Well, there's definitely something there, and looking at the pinouts of the 40077, this is definitely the pin range of the data bus. So let's give this a bit of a clean and see if we can wash out whatever that is. Hmm, well, whatever it was doesn't seem to have been too substantial, but I guess it may just have been enough to throw a spanner in the works. I had a similar thing on an Amiga 1200 last year, so stranger things have happened. Looking around the rest of the mainboard under the microscope does reveal that the whole thing is covered in awfulness that may well be invisible to the naked eye, but could be harbouring all sorts of nasty things. So I guess we should give the whole board a clean while we're here and reseat all of the ICs as well. Some of these 30 plus year old chips were hanging on for dear life and we need to be really careful not to yank them out too roughly or we might bend or break legs or worse still break the chips themselves. Easy squeezy does it. These ROMs look in good condition but I may swap these out for a diagnostic ROM if after this little clean up we're not getting anywhere. After a good clean, the board is looking much more healthy and I'm happy to say that after getting that bit of detritus out of the 40077 gate array, we're not getting a short on the Z80 data lines either. So let's plug back in and see what we get. Good news everyone! It seems we have a working board. Horrible to think that someone sold this thinking it was broken and all it needed was a good wash. Still, good for me because I now have a plus 2A in my collection. Happy days. Right, couple of other things I want to do here. Remember I mentioned the tape port on the back of the plus 2A? Well, you might be thinking that would allow you to use an external cassette deck instead of the built-in one, or more importantly, a modern SD card based cassette deck replacement such as this SVI CAS. But you'd be wrong, because from the factory that port is set up only as an output, basically a headphone socket. But there's a little trick we can pull to sort that out. First, we need to desolder the tape port. With the port removed, we can see that the left and right channels are joined together, so they both act as an output. We're going to cut that trace in the middle to give us two separate channels. Then we're going to run a wire from that newly created channel to the same point the signal from the internal cassette deck comes in, the negative pin of the capacitor at C200, which is around there somewhere. So let's scratch away that trace, ensuring that we get all the way through, and then we can fix our wire to the newly created channel and run that all the way over to C200. Once all soldered in, we'll cover it up with some captain tape and we should be all good. We don't want to neglect the internal drive, so let's replace the rubber drive belt. And as you can see here where this one has developed a kink from being stored in the same place for years on end. And it is also likely to have lost its elasticity. If you're doing this yourself, it's important to get the absolute right size belt for the Plus 2A as the Plus 2 had a two belt system and they were different sizes if my memory serves me right. Put the wrong belt on and it could be too tight and end up wearing out the bearings in the drive. Well, with the new belt installed, let's put the old girl back together and see if she's all working now.
Right, let's see if the internal cassette deck works. I realised I didn't film it, but I did re-grease all the movements and clean the heads with a cotton bud and isopropyl alcohol. I've got this rugby game to try, so let's see what happens. That's a good start and we're getting a good signal, although a truly great signal would be where the blue and red bars are equal and not moving up or down the screen. Normally that's just an adjustment of the azimuth, so maybe I'll give that a go. Um, this tape got about halfway through and errored out. Looking at the tape itself, it's clear that it's a bit kinked up and really that's the trouble with old magnetic media. It is going to fail at some point. Luckily for us, we made the modification to the tape port so we can hopefully use this SVI CAS. Keep your fingers crossed and we'll see if this works too. That's what I mean about a nice pure signal even red and blue bars with no crawl. So that means the external port is working as an input now. Fabulous. So now we know it's all good, let's put the screws back in and you may have noticed that the rubber feet on the bottom are missing. I didn't have any of the actual replacements, but I did have these similar ones, which I can just offset to the side whilst I get some ordered. Let's give the top of the casing keyboard a good once over while we're here, so the outside looks as pretty as the inside. This machine may well go back on the market now, as in the past few hours, I've just managed to nab one of these, almost new, in its original box. So this one may as well go to a new owner, now that it's working again. The next few videos are quite Sinclair focused, so forgive me fans of other systems, I just have a backlog of things to complete and they all seem to be Sinclair related. People also seem to like the retro perspective review of Dungeon Master that I did a while back, so I'll be choosing another title and diving into that. Any suggestions, please put them in the comments. Now a last little snippet, you'll notice on the screen that it says plus 3 basic. That's because the Plus 2B mainboard was shipped with the Amstrad 4.1 ROM that was used in the Plus 3 also. It's also interesting to note that the Spectrum Plus 2B mainboard was the very last to be shipped in a Sinclair branded Spectrum. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the episode, always nice to get a quick win and add a bit of functionality to make things more usable in today's world. Thanks for watching, please don't forget to subscribe, it really helps to support the channel. Drop your comments below as we always love to read them and until next time in the shack, it's goodbye from me.